Hello everyone. I must first thank Morali and Anrit for inviting me to this workshop. It's a bit odd to be speaking to the camera rather than to a live group, but let us make the best of the situation. So, hello to my co-panelists, Anrit and Murli, and to Bruce, whom also I have met earlier, and to Jennifer Adolf and Professor Annabel Sribani, whom I haven't met. And good morning to all those who have gathered for this workshop. I've been asked to speak about decentralizing the internet, developing country perspectives. Speaking about decentralizing the internet, the first issue is to examine where is power located on the internet or rather how does the internet relocate power in our societies. The increasing concern experienced by the institution of the state vis-a-vis -vis the new communication realm which appears to be much more slippery than anything it has dealt with before is very clear and obvious and the corresponding defensive actions of the state and civil society's struggles against them largely pay out at the national levels. There certainly are some strong reverberations of these struggles on the global scene, most clearly captured in the shrill alarm of UN how to take control of the internet that we hear so often. The latest arena of these struggles is the forthcoming important meetings of the International Telecommunication Union or the ITU. The fears vis a vis what may happen at the ITU or even generally at the UN are very real. While I'm tempted to, I won't say that they are exaggerated. However, they're certainly unbalanced and one sided. And behind this one sidedness lies a tale. It is this tale which I understand has inspired the title of our session today Negotiating Profits and Politics Through Internet Freedom. This tale is about the strongest powers on the internet who are busy in this formative time of the internet and the information society to entrench themselves and to devise newer and newer means of extortion and accumulation. While they do this, they need a good political cover, especially in a world which has today so well provided by with informational and communicative and also collaborative possibilities that can so easily galvanize adverse political action. I will speak about this important issue of the political cover a little later. Internet was created as an end-to-end -end platform joining just anyone and everyone with a basic digital device on equitable terms. However, what was a network of millions of networks is increasingly more and more dominated by just few mega digital applications. Think Google, Facebook, Twitter, Apple and Amazon and you have kind of covered a good part of the internet. There are young people for whom Facebook is the internet. Many telecos offer Facebook free without the rest of the internet, which is a clear violation of the end-to-end -end principle, also called net neutrality. Net neutrality is today being violated in so many different ways. For entrenching greater advantage for the biggest players on the internet and reducing competitiveness. We are well on the way to what may be called as a shopping mall paradigm of the internet from what was a public street paradigm. Meanwhile, unbelievable consolidation and vertical integration in the internet space continues unchecked and the major internet companies are increasingly law unto themselves. They of course do take subtle cues from the US authorities to behave, a bit also from the EU, but for the rest of the world it is a straightforward take it or leave it proposition. Google nowadays freely mixes commercial logic into its search algorithms which no one can know of or regulate in public interest. Facebook decides what to do with your personal data. If you don't like this, disconnect from the world. Similarly, as in the old times, as one could always escape the tyranny of kingdoms by going and living in the jungles. I think all this of how the internet biggies behave is a familiar story for all of us from newspapers and journals. Together, these few monopoly companies are shaping the social architecture not only of our communicative and informational systems, but also generally of global social, economic, political and cultural flows. But to be able to do so, these companies have to escape all possibilities of public interest regulation of their global operations. For this, they have the solid political backing of the US, 
which today represents a greater concentration of political, economic, military, cultural power than perhaps has ever been with one entity in entire human history. While the US in any case has commanding influence, if not control, over the big US-based internet monopolies, the mutual relationship between these two greatest political and economic powers on the internet today is being cemented through legislations like the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, or more as more popularly known as SIPSA, whereby close ongoing cooperation between these entities and the US government is now blessed with legislative protections. So if today there is a central control room of the global internet, it is in the US with the executives of these internet monopolies and US government agents sitting in it, working together, watching and seeking to control the world. They command the political economy of the internet and through it as per their best hopes of the emergent social order. There is no way that IQ can ever come even close to having the power that is currently exercised through this control room. Plurilateral bodies like the EU, Council of Europe and OECD sometimes do make some public interest noises and at times some, some, only some of these concerns get accommodated. But mostly it is a unipolar digital imperialism which not only has a geopolitical basis and this is a very important point to consider. It also has a very significant global class basis representing the political interests and alliances of the richer classes from across the world. If all this, if all such far-reaching structural changes are indeed taking place in our society today on and due to the internet with deep social, economic and cultural implications for our societies. Why is it that we do not hear any coherent global civil society voices about them? Why do we only passingly hear of these issues incoherent and unformed in newspaper columns? There certainly is a global civil society in the internet governance space that we all know so well as the primary agent that regularly rings the UN and ITU alarm bells. What sweet drug dumps the global civil society's social, economic, cultural sensations is a question to ponder on. This brings us to a quick discussion on what I had referred to as the political cover for the activities of the dominant forces on the internet. For easy recognition, we can label this cover as internet freedom. This cover is substantially built over actual political consolidation of richer classes across the world, for whom, to put it summarily, US political stewardship is preferred to nation-based political dispensations at home. The stated problem with the latter generally is corruption and unaccountability, but the real one mostly is their redistributional tendencies in face of deep economic disparities. Underlying often is a struggle in many countries among old political elites and new economic elites, with the new economic elites often joining up in a global middle class, accepting, if somewhat grudgingly, US political stewardship of the world. Symbolically, this is most clearly evidenced in the manner that the global internet governance civil society soft pedals the issue of US unilateral control over the basic internet infrastructure. The code word here is I can. Democracy and sovereignty seem to this new political alliance as old-fashioned modernist ideas with social Darwinist spirit of neoliberalism taking over completely. The capable will inherit the world. Manuel Castells rather ominously predicted how the network would connect valuable to valuable, casting off the less valuable, straddling and bypassing geographies. The new global middle class is the truest embodiment of this theoretical insight. Its power is most strongly expressed in global capital, which is now globally mobile and politically out of control as never before. Its political seat is the US government, though still in an uneasy and forming relationship. And its apology bearer is an emergent new kind of a global civil society, at present most well formed in the internet governance space. This new political alliance of the powerful from across the globe uses the intense communicative and informational context of the internet to its advantage rather than allow it to become a counterforce. 
I do not have the time to go into how this is achieved, but I think that to the media scholars who have assembled here, it must be increasingly obvious. What is relatively new in the present context, however, is the manner in which a specific kind of global civil society is built, supported and kept alive to provide a political cover or a smokescreen for the many deeply problematic power shifts that are taking place on and through the internet with the exceptional intensity characteristic of paradigmatic social transformational times as we are witness to today. I must, however, end on a more positive and forward-looking note. When the phenomenon of internet struck us in the closing years of the last century, there was an initial attempt to develop a civil society agenda around communication rights and the internet. I here refer to the CRIS or Communication Rights in the Information Society campaign. Some of the panelists here today were actively involved with this campaign. Sometime over the last decade, intertwined with the structural changes to the involved civil society, this agenda got jettisoned in favour of a single point civil society agenda of multi-stakeholderism in internet governance. While initially posited to fight statist forces trying to cast the internet in their image, multi-stakeholderism quickly became simply a means to enable global digital capital to build the political power that was required to resist possible opposition to its triumphant march of global extortion. In the circumstances, I exhort the communication and media scholars and activists who have assembled for this conference to once again systematically explore an agenda of communication rights vis-a-vis -vis the internet. They need to claim the legitimate civil society space in the global internet governance arena from corporate and imperialist apologists. As an immediate practical measure, may I suggest that the next meeting of the International Association of Media and Communication Research perhaps decides to just focus on this one issue of internet governance. I leave you with these thoughts and I would indeed miss what I'm sure would be very interesting and insightful discussions at this workshop and generally at the conference. Thank you.